Hi, welcome to my channel. My name is Jessica, and today we are going to be covering a deeper look into cemeteries and post-mortem choices. On Saturdays, I do a deeper look into crime video, which are on topics that revolve either around crime or death. And on Tuesdays, I do true crime videos. This video is for educational purposes only. I am not an expert. I have just done research on this topic and have pulled information together to make this video. I would also like to add a trigger warning here. We are going to be talking briefly about someone self-unaliving themselves. So if that's too much for you, I'll let you know exactly when we're gonna do that and when to skip to so you don't have to hear that part. But without further ado, let's get into it. Burial traditions have developed alongside religion and philosophy, and probably even earlier. Scientists have even found burial sites from Neanderthals all around the world. Each and every culture has their own rituals, ceremonies, and practices that are unique to them to take care of their loved ones' bodies after death. But my question is, how did cemeteries get to be what they are today? Well, in Europe during the 2nd and 5th century, the Catholic Church had a very strong hold and say on what happened to the deceased. In Rome, this is when they built the catacombs. A catacomb is a labyrinth of underground tunnel systems where they place the bones of the dead on the walls and under the floors. First, they would place the deceased in mass graves and allow the bodies to decompose. Once the bodies were decomposed, they would go back, collect the bones, and put them in the catacombs. These catacombs were built and still are under the control of the Roman church, and Christians weren't the only ones that were buried there either. Pagans and Jews were as well. And I thought that was pretty cool because the Catholic church is, well, super strict, and they don't really have the best history of accepting others. They started to build these catacombs because they were running out of space on church grounds for individual burials, so they thought that this would be a really good option. People of importance were still buried on church grounds, and they had full stone inscriptions. The rich people were buried on the east side, so that way they could be the closest to the rising sun. And this is important, so we'll get back to it later. Middle class was buried on the south side, and the indigents, unknown travelers, stillborns, and undesirables, aka poor people, were buried on the north side. At the time, only wealthy people were able to afford tombstones. Everyone else just had metal or wooden crosses that were placed at their burial site. Later, more churches were being built and cemeteries also started to pop up as well as more catacombs. These catacombs were in many different countries, some including Greece, Australia, Egypt, Spain, and the Philippines. Recently, a strain of bacteria has been discovered that thrive in catacombs that produce mineral efflorescence. This appears as a grayish-white salt deposit on the skeletal remains, and this causes damage to the catacombs. Interestingly enough, they actually found two other bacterial strains that have the potential to produce counteractive enzymes for these mineral deposits. Even with these catacombs popping up in a lot of different areas and more churches and cemeteries being built, there were still people that were being buried on families' properties and even being thrown in mass graves near the heart of major cities. And this led to an epidemic in Great Britain and the United States, and I'm sure really everywhere. The government had to find a way to stop people from getting sick, and they also had to find a way to stop corpses from just chilling in the middle of town. In 1665, the Lord Mayor of London came up with an order that, quote, all graves shall be at least six foot deep. This kept them low enough that the grave digger could still get out without a ladder for the farmers to not be able to plow up the bodies, and also deep enough so that way the bacteria and diseases couldn't spread. Later on, the rule of thumb was that the grave should be as deep as the person is tall. They also started building and moving cemeteries to more rural areas. That way, they could make the cemeteries bigger, and they were also further away from the more highly populated areas. Nowadays, different states and countries have their own depth requirements. Most states require that there are 18 inches of dirt on top of the casket, which in turn turns out to be about four feet deep. In 1831, the United States built their first cemetery in rural Massachusetts, and they built it based on the Père Lachaise Cemetery in Paris. I hope I pronounced that right. 
So again, though, people are still burying their loved ones on family properties and in churches, but the majority of these people are still going in mass graves because they're still in the middle of this epidemic. So there's a lot of children and mothers that are dying. And this is on top of the mothers and babies already dying of natural causes at that time because of the lack of medical knowledge. So on top of all these other deaths, I mean, people were just dying left and right from smallpox, typhus, scarlet fever, and yellow fever. I mean, it was bad. So this big new cemetery gave people a place where they could go and visit and mourn their loved ones. This cemetery had big gates, beautiful statues, and large areas of land. These gates were seen as a symbol for families to leave their troubles of the outside world outside of the gates and made a space where they could resonate deeper with their spirituality. There were even travel guides for families to walk around with and a ton of picnic tables for them to eat at. This cemetery became a common place for picnics, shooting, hunting, and carriage riding. However, all this congregating became way too much for the cemetery staff to be able to keep up with. In between the crowding and the littering, they just couldn't do it. As a result, many cemeteries banned food consumption and large gatherings on their grounds. These large rural cemeteries are now called memorial parks. Nowadays, most people just go to cemeteries for the funerals and try to avoid them after that. The architecture in cemeteries now is cold and stark with simple plaques or tombstones with names and dates on them. There are some graveyards now that have computer terminals where families get to see pictures of their loved ones along with biographies and their favorite excerpts from books and poems. Have you ever wondered why all the tombstones in cemeteries tend to face the same way? Probably not, because, I mean, it makes sense. It's easier to read them as you're walking by. However, that isn't the reason why all tombstones and bodies tend to face the same way. The actual reason is because the afterlife is so closely tied to religion, belief, and superstition. Way before Christianity became what it is today, pagans and other sun-based religions bury their deceased facing east to greet their afterlife in each new day as the sun rises. Some Christians also bury their deceased facing east because of the belief of the second coming of Christ. The scripture says that he will come from the east and that all the dead will be able to meet him face to face. And some people even believe that when he comes, he will bring the dead back to life. After a while, this became a norm in the cemetery world, and now there's a lot of restrictions for cemeteries, and one of them is about keeping the tombstones facing east, not only for aesthetic reasons, but also for the workers. Some religious groups also bury their deceased loved ones to the west for the same reasons. Some Jewish cemeteries face west, so that way they could face the direction of Israel. Some Muslims also like to bury their deceased, so that way they're facing west. That way they could either be facing or perpendicular to Mecca. There are also a lot of old tombstones that are facing west, but that doesn't exactly mean that the bodies are facing west. And some Christian church leaders are also buried facing west. That way they could look after their flock and guide them when the second coming of Christ comes. This is the area where I'm going to insert the trigger warning. We are going to start talking about people who unalive themselves. And if that is too much for you and you want to skip ahead, you could go right up to this timestamp and I'll see you there. During the late 1700s and early 1800s in Great Britain, they would bury criminals and suicide victims at crossroads by themselves with a stake through their heart and no right to a religious ceremony. Based on a mix of superstition and religion, they thought that by doing this, it would confuse their ghost spirit and they wouldn't be able to haunt any of the living. They thought that committing suicide was a shocking abomination and some of these crossroads are still around today. The most known one is Kitty J's grave. Her exact name isn't known. I saw Ann J and Mary J, but Kitty J was her nickname. This happened a long time ago and documentation isn't great, especially because a lot of the story was spread by word of mouth. But according to the story, Kitty became pregnant by a farmer's son out of wedlock and when his family found out, they kicked her out of the house. Kitty grew up as an orphan, so she didn't have any family and she had no place to go, and word started spreading around town. The most common belief is that she unalived herself in a barn on the farmer's property by hanging herself. She was buried at a crossroad in Dartmoor, Devon, England. The grave is now kind of a tourist attraction where a lot of times people will go and leave flowers for her. People have also claimed to see her ghost floating around that crossroad at night. Before we're done with this topic, I did find an interesting note from ancient Greeks and Romans, and they actually saw 
unaliving oneself very differently than we do today and saw it as a person using free will to depart a miserable life and leaving in peace instead of living a miserable one. While doing research, I couldn't help but think what happens to our bodies after we're buried. Well, as soon as our heart stops beating, our cells become acidic, and that starts a chemical reaction that breaks down the cells. Even once your blood is replaced with embalming fluid, your body does still break down, and it continues to break down for decades. After only four months, the molecular integrity of your cells are gone and your tissues begin to rot. After a year, all the tissues in your body completely disintegrate and turn into a liquid. After 80 to 100 years, the collagen in your bones are long gone and the bones themselves become so frail that they will reduce to a powder if disturbed. All that will be left behind are the synthetic clothing fibers, the casket lining, and the corpse's teeth. So now we know how cemeteries became what they are today and what happens to our bodies after being buried. But what about if the graveyard closes down? Well, it varies country to country, but something we do know is graveyards only have so much space and most plots are only used once. So cemeteries have to come up with something to extend the life of their land. <laughs> See what I did there? Some places use up every bit of land using sidewalks and the spaces between already existing graves. The Church of England puts multiple caskets in individual plots. What they do is they dig back up the plot, they take out the first casket, dig the hole deeper, and then put the first casket back in and then the second casket on top. Another thing that's done is that they will rent the plot instead of sell it. So that way when your lease is up, they'll exhume the body, cremate it, and then give the remains back to the existing family members. This is common in Germany, Australia, and New Zealand. But what happens when space completely runs out? Because we know that that's bound to happen. Well, some cemeteries set up a perpetual care fund. Doing this helps extend the funds, especially if done early on. And the longer that they have funds for, the more that they can do, the more money, the more options. But if the cemetery doesn't have any more space and no more money, then it's likely that that cemetery is either gonna go through bankruptcy or just close down altogether. Sometimes local governments will take over the land and care for it. Other times cemeteries will be closed or repurposed for commercial use or home building. The process of buying and selling land though that was a cemetery comes with a lot of legal hurdles, especially in the United States. And that's because any generation of the deceased have ongoing rights to visit and care for the grave. Court will approve for the land to be repurposed, making the new homeowners in charge of moving all the graves to a new suitable area. However, commonly courts will make it the family's responsibility to find a new suitable place for their deceased loved one. But it all comes down to the discretion of the judge, the buyers, and the family. So I wanted to finish off this video talking about the different options that people have other than the traditional burial and cremation. So the traditional burial is what we all know. Your body is drained of your blood and replaced with embalming fluid. You're then placed in a casket and is buried in a cemetery. Traditional cremation is an option that most of us also know. It's when your body is burned down into ashes, which is made from your bones, which is either spread somewhere of importance or kept in the possession of a family member in an urn. In 2015, cremation actually surpassed the traditional burial in the most common choices after death. And really, I think that that's because you could do so many things with the ashes. You can put them into fireworks, resin, glass, and so many other things. You could also have your ashes mixed into marine grade concrete and become part of an artificial reef where life can continue to grow on you. That's what I'm having done. That's my option. Another option that's growing in popularity are natural burials, also known as green burials. With this option, there is no embalming fluids or other chemicals that are used unless it is derived from nature. Some essential oils can be used to help break down the body if needed, but this also means that there's no casket or concrete vault. There are a few different ways to do a natural burial, including the traditional natural burial, a mushroom burial, and a tree pod burial. In the traditional natural burial, your body is placed in a biodegradable casket and you are dressed into biodegradable clothing made from natural fibers. As your body naturally decomposes through time, you and everything that you got buried with goes back into nature and you fertilize the land around you. 
There are no tombstones, but most of the natural burial sites allow wooden plaques, engraved rocks, and trees. And I mean, it makes sense why this is growing in popularity. It's eco-friendly, it's much cheaper than the traditional burial. And on top of that, it's more spiritual instead of religious. I didn't know about this one until I did some research, but there's a mushroom burial. The actor Luke Perry did this and it helped make mushroom burials more known. Instead of being in a casket, you are dressed in a cotton bodysuit that has mushroom spores sewn into it. These mushrooms not only help to decompose your body faster, but they also help to pull any of the toxins that are in the soil out, making the area around you more nutrient rich. Next, we're going to talk about tree pod burials. And I remember seeing this like 10 years ago when it was circulating on Facebook and I thought it was so interesting. This is where your body is placed into a plastic biodegradable egg in the fetal position and a small tree is attached to it. The egg breaks down with your body, allowing the nutrients from your body to supply the sapling above it. There are also options for these tree pod burials with ashes, but I just think that the natural burials are so cool because the majority of all these natural burial cemeteries are going to be forests, which is just beautiful. Okay, now we're going to step away from the natural burials and talk about this one that isn't really as well known. It's called alkaline hydrolysis. This is also known as flameless cremation, water cremation, or green cremation. Basically, your body is placed in a large metal chamber where you are surrounded by 95% water and 5% potassium hydroxide or sodium hydroxide. The chamber is then heated up pressurized and shaken to help the hydroxide solution break down your body, leaving bone fragments and a sterile liquid made up of water, salt, sugars, amino acids, and peptides. That water solution goes down the drain just like all other water waste, and all that's left behind are bone fragments that don't have any tissue or DNA. Those bone fragments are then pulverized and turned into ashes, so you get ashes just like a traditional cremation. However, you get 32% more ashes because you're not using fire. The process of alkaline hydrolysis isn't available in all areas, and it's not even legal in some. So if you're interested in this process, then definitely look it up. The last one that we're going to talk about, and it's definitely something that sounds futuristic, and it's something straight out of the show The 100. It's cryopreservation. There are people on this earth right now that are in cryopreservation, either as their whole body or just as neuropatients where it's only their brains. The companies that take these patients are only allowed to get them once they are legally, clinically dead. Once they pick up the patient, they are then transported to a cryonics lab where their blood is removed and then replaced with a cryoprotectant chemical. And this chemical is pretty much a medical grade antifreeze that dehydrates the cells. This stops the body from decomposing and it also stops the formation of ice crystals when the body is placed into liquid nitrogen. And liquid nitrogen is around negative 320 degrees Fahrenheit or negative 196 degrees Celsius. The goal is for the cells to form a glass structure so it doesn't damage the cell. The cryonics community believes that these patients aren't really dead, that they are just being held in suspension waiting to be reanimated when medical technology has grown enough to cure their medical conditions. And since cryonics only works with clinically dead patients, there aren't that many laws that are directly associated to cryopreservation. The main focus they have is to follow laws that are set to protect unburied and untreated corpses. Alcor is the leading company in the industry who are located in Scottsdale, Arizona, with over 130 patients. They charge $80,000 to preserve a brain and $200,000 to preserve a whole body. Oh, and some life insurance policies also help with the cost. No patients have been brought back yet, but in 2016, MIT scientists have brought back a rabbit brain to near-perfect condition. They found no damage in the neurons or the synapses, and because of that, they hypothesized that this rabbit still has its long-term memory. As of right now, the issue that the cryonics community is having is that cryonicists will have to find out a way to bring back people without their cells crystallizing in the warming process and how to repair the tissues that have been frozen for so long. 
Right now, they're working on nanorobots that can break a strand of DNA at a certain peptide and then a new and altered DNA strand can be inserted back into it. We definitely don't know what the future holds, but we do know some of how we got to where we are today. And I only scratched the surface of these topics because I didn't want the video to be like five hours long. Thank you so much for watching this video and hanging out with me today. If you have any other topics that you would like me to cover, please put them in the comments down below. And if you like this video, please consider liking it and subscribing to my channel. But other than that, I hope you all have an amazing rest of your day. Bye. To more rural, rural, rural grave robber. No. <laughs> Did it. <coughs>